Hello to our audience of L3i conference. Uh, so here we are. We are hosting the uh, research panel uh, titled uh, How much should conversation AI developer know about machine learning and linguistics? And here I am a senior machine learning researcher at RASA. My name is Vladimir Lasov. And uh, here is with me Anna Rogers. Emily Bender and Thomas Wolf, and hopefully Rachel uh, Tatman will join us later. Uh, yeah, so I, I guess it's better if we start with uh, everyone introducing themselves. Maybe we start with Anna. Anna, could you please? Um, introduce yeah, so I'm a computational linguist. I'm currently in University of Copenhagen, um, and I have been working on uh, BERT and uh, interpreting uh, transformer based models recently. Great, and uh, yeah, let, let's go further. Uh, Emily, uh, could you please introduce yourself? Sure. My name is Emily Bender. I'm a professor in the Department of Linguistics at the University of Washington, where I've been since 2003. I run our professional master's program in computational linguistics, and I'm interested in um, the interaction between linguistics and natural language processing, um, sort of both ways, how can they inform each other? I'm interested in multilingual natural language processing and um, most recently in the societal impacts of natural language processing systems. Very interesting. And um, Thomas? Yeah, so um, I have an unusual background. I used to be a physicist and then I was a lawyer for a few years. So I joined NLP quite recently, um, four years ago. Uh, I've been a uh, the chief science officer at Hugging Face, where we started doing um, science mostly on, on generative models on chatbots. And then we, we started open sourcing our tools. And now we kind of work a lot on open source and open science and basically everything we can do to um, catalyze and democratize all the research uh, that's happening in NLP right now. Great. And um... Yeah, uh, I also have physics background, so maybe it's not as unusual as uh, maybe as, as it was before. Uh, yeah, and uh, so here at RASA, we are building a standard infrastructure for developers to build uh, conversationalized software, mostly task-oriented conversationalized software. And uh, therefore, I would like to uh, focus our discussion at uh, how much the problems are differ difficult or maybe there are additional changes of what is different from the so to say classical NLP when we speak in, in the conversational domain or in the conversational form so what changes uh, in particular also uh, so if I imagine myself a developer how much do I need to know about all of it? Uh, for example, a uh, simple example is, do I need to know how BERT works in order to use it? Uh, and, and so on. And so I would like to start um, uh, on a more general, like BERT is a, one of the language models that pre-trained language models that exist today. And uh, we have many of them. Uh, and we have many of them for different languages and so on and so on. And the first uh, question is uh, maybe briefly, uh, if you could give, uh, could, could tell us, uh, what do you think these language models actually know? What information do they consist and what information do, do they convey uh, uh, when we uh, apply them to the natural text uh, and what, what information from it that we can get in order to re reuse it, say, in the conversation to, to predict what, how should we answer and so on. Um, yeah. Who, who is the answer the question to? Uh, I mean, I guess if you, I, I, it's, it's better. So since we have the all different backgrounds, I think it's, it's better if everyone could give a brief answer from their, from their point of view, and then we could, see uh, whether there is some contradiction or maybe difference in opinion or, uh, about this, uh, this topic. So Anna, we, we can start with you. Okay. Um, so uh, 
as for what, what Bert knows, I think it has actually be two different questions. Um, what can be extracted from Bert and what Bert actually uses when it, as a fine-tuned model, ma makes its own inter inferences? Because um, these are two different things. Uh, you can use language models and you can probe it and you can maybe extract uh, uh, information that it might have that it doesn't actually use for making its own inferences. Hmm. And uh, that's uh, how a lot of papers uh, that have been published in the recent years were finding that it has a lot of syntactic knowledge, a lot of uh, cross-lingual correspondences, a lot of factual knowledge. Uh, we don't actually know that this is how it arrives at its inferences uh, when it is fine-tuned. Ah, yeah, that's, that's true, yeah. Okay. But, uh, uh, but what is, uh, do you have an opinion? What is like, in the end, we get the text, we get a string, and we get a number out of it. So uh, do you have any, like, what is, in your opinion, is the connection between the text and between, the, what, what are these number represent, so to say, in a couple of words? Uh, most likely, this number represents uh, the number of easy cues in your data set that the that bird was able to learn, irrespective of any knowledge of language. Cool. Yeah. Uh, Emily, so maybe... Uh, uh. Yeah, um, I appreciate this perspective on the question of what is it that Bert knows. And I think thinking about this audience of developers of conversational chatbots, the main thing that I want people to know that it doesn't know is that it doesn't have any sense of communicative intent. All right, so Bert can read in a bunch of language and it sees patterns of symbols, and it can give you back information about what a likely symbol or a set of next symbols are in that context. But all of that is completely divorced from any notion of what the uh, utterer of the language it was reading was actually trying to convey. And if Bert then generates a further string, it is not a communicative agent that's got some intent of something it's trying to convey as well. So you can use a language model to um, Say, well, this is a more probable string in this context. But if you're trying to build a system where, say, a company is um, uh, committed to the content of the text that the chatbot is putting out, then just letting the language models go play does not sound like a very safe choice. Okay, that, that's so. So basically, uh, what you mean is Bear just knows some. Uh, I mean, from the from your paper, actually, some form of the language or some way of uh, uh, of a statistic, like a statistic on a word or character level, and doesn't really contain any uh, any sort of connection to the actual meaning. What we humans think is is the meaning. Yeah, yeah, and that's a little bit tricky to grasp because as humans who speak languages, as soon as we perceive the form, some form in a language we speak, we usually immediately are also perceiving meaning. And so it's a little bit hard to keep our eyes on the fact that those are two separate things. And that's where linguistics is really crucial to this enterprise because linguistics is studying that. How do the forms and the meanings relate to each other? I have maybe a good example about that because remember uh, some time ago we had a issue, one of our users created a very simple uh, data set to differentiate between fruits and vegetables. And then uh, this user provided, I don't know, a couple of oranges, apples for fruits, and, the, or, and then uh, cabbage, uh, cucumbers, so what for vegetables. And then this user was surprised why manga was not recognized as a fruit, uh, while manga never, was never there. But, but it is apparently very hard to grasp for people to that, okay, for us, manga is a fruit, so if I put a couple of oranges, but for these models, manga is just M, A, N, and G, and O. So it doesn't mean mm -hmm. that it necessarily needs to be a fruit if it never saw it during training. Yeah, sorry, I just, I just thought that this might be an example of this meaning versus form. Uh, yeah, maybe. It is a nice example, though actually, depending on what you've trained Bert over, the distributional similarity of orange, apple, and mango in a big enough collection of text might let Bert say, okay, you want me to pick things from this region, mango fits closer to orange and apple than it does to cabbage and um, shallots. I don't know what else the other vegetables were. Um, but that doesn't mean that it knows what a fruit is or much less what a mango is, right? It's, those are just words that happen to co-occur in similar distributions. Yeah. Thomas, and what is your point of view on this uh, topic? 
Yeah, I think uh, um, I think that's a, that's a very good question, and, and and what I say will be really in the line of what uh, Anna and um, and Emily said. I, I think basically these models they're they kind of hard to handle in somehow because they can be very good and very bad at the same time. Uh, if you're really in domain for the models, you can have like surprisingly good thing that we had really a hard time getting with with pre neural net methods. Um, but as soon as you go out of domain, you've got these these very these very weird failures that you can't really predict because in the end, these models they are just using surface form and not not any semantic meaning. So they will fail in way that are really unexpected. And the main problem is that it's really hard to measure if you're in domain or out of domain. It's also um, it's also sometimes we kind of focus on the model, but this basically means that the, the training data is actually what is important, right? It, it's what you should know about your model more than than that it's model pay made by Google, right? You don't really care about that, but what you care about is not the architecture at all, but it's what, what, what it was trained on. And if it was trained on something that just don't talk about Mongo, there is no way to really know about okay. Mongo. And you have all these things about prompts. So if you pre-process your data set in some way that uh, put some, um, like, like some regular pattern or something like that, the model will really get used to this very, 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 very quickly. Uh, and then, uh, we have this this very um, weird failure by the, the fact that this model always takes the, the short pass to the answer. So that's what Anna said. Basically, we try to rely on, on this very uh, surface form easy thing. Like you have a lot of nuts, so probably the label is a contradiction, but that's just because you annotated your thing with your annotator who just use nuts because it's easy to write a contradiction with nuts, right? So so they have all these all these things that you basically can't really tell if you don't know what the model was trained on. And this is some part we tend to forget too much. And obviously, this also opens all the doors to the biases that are in your training data and that your model just reproduce very basically um, without thinking about them. So it can be hard. It can be also hard because for us humans, natural language is, is so uh, easy and that's so deeply uh, the way we think that it, it's really hard to, to understand that the models don't, don't think like we do. We, we saw that at Hugging Face where we were doing chatbot in the beginning and like chat, chat, chatbot seems very easy for us because we spend our days talking and like it's so natural for us to be chatting, but it's actually like very, very complex process and so hard to make it well. And so, yeah, it's hard sometimes to step back and see how natural language is actually this complex thing that is really hard to make, uh, to, to put in a model. So yeah, they're good and bad. Sorry, that's the answer. <laughs> and you need to know them. I think the, the conclusion is that you need to know them and you need to know more about how we make them and how you can evaluate them. And linguistic is the, is the way we can basically evaluate them, I think, in my opinion. So, but about biases, I think particularly in BERT is even worse. It's not only your data that you fine tuned it on, it most probably is the data that it was pre-trained on, something that you have no control whatsoever, right? So. But so you said we need to know what they're trained on. So, for example, uh, so uh, uh, Eigenface Transformer is a very famous library for using many different uh, uh, language models. So we at RAS also provide that. So, for example, before uh, creating your uh, intent classifier, you can choose which model to use. Uh, we don't provide, we don't uh, pr allow pre-training of the model, but we rather using the model as a frozen embedding. And now as a developer, I am facing the, uh, the choice, GPT-2, BERT, Robert, Albert, uh, whatever, OpenAI, and all of them are trained in a different data. Like, so should I, what, what should I do? Uh, should I just go read, okay, what data they're trained on uh, uh, and figure out whether it is the same as my domain or like any sort of so, yeah. I, I have an opinion here. Um, so yeah. in, um, in 2018, there was a bunch of work sort of looking at precisely this problem. So as Thomas says, you're, when you train on lots and lots of data, you're going to pick up biases in that data, and that's going to have downstream effects. And so there was work starting in sort of 2015, 2016 um, by people like Eileen Kaliskan um, and others sort of, um, and um, um, uh, Bullock Bassi et al. sort of highlighting this problem, um, focusing, I think, initially on gender, um, but there's various kinds of biases that show up. And um, by 2018, people were saying, okay, 
problem, yes. Now, what can we do about it? And um, the answer that was emerging in uh, across a bunch of different groups. So Timnit Gebru et al. came up with something called data sheets for data sets. Um, uh, Holland et al. did something called the data set nutrition label. Um, Meg Mitchell and colleagues have model cards for model reporting. And Batya Friedman and I did data statements um, for data sets. So, so across all of these, what's in common is the idea that um, we need to document information about the training data, whose language, what genre, what's the speech situation. And that's, so the data statements one is sort of focused specifically on natural language data. So I'm giving you the natural language version of it, but basically whose, whose behavior or language or appearance is this that we're training on? Um, how did we choose what to train on? What was the sort of curation rationale and so on? So that when someone goes to pick up one of these models, they are positioned to understand whether it's a good fit for what they're trying to do and also what kind of biases they might be needing to mitigate down the line. Um, so my advice to developers is you should insist on models being documented in this way. And if they're not, then don't pick them up. And it's a big ask because if the model is something that has to be trained on, you know, petabytes of data, then it's a lot of work to document it, but all the more important because nobody can go through it by hand. Yeah, but then counter argument would be right. So at some point, uh, Glove was the best, uh, then Elma arrived, and then very short after Elma, Bert arrived. So you sp if you spent all your time to document Elma, for example, it will be all gone because everyone switched to Bert. I think there is always a, an equilibrium between all these models. But yeah, I think it's a very good thing. And uh, I'll do a little bit of. Uh, uh, a plug on shameless plug on what we are doing, but we, we are really trying to push for that. So, so hugging face was was at first just just to share the official model, but we we now have a way to let the community upload their models, which is basically uh, everybody who has some GPU. And it's very nice because there are a lot of multilingual models that are trained this way, and and um, we we've started to make this so you can also have a model card with this, and we can you know, try to uh, push people to upload the model card at the same time. So there is always a kind of balance so that we, we are trying to find. So, um, so the reason I'm saying that is because right now, uh, Julien is working a lot on the website to try to make it like um, basically that you can uh, have a lot more information on your models and on your checkpoints. These are really checkpoints, right? Because this, we are not talking about the architecture, really. We're talking about checkpoints oh. on how the model was trained and on which data. And so each checkpoint can, can have different things. Mm -hmm. And we, we want to have this like this. Uh, so obviously, like follow the all the work on model card by uh, Michel and and uh, Timnit Debru. I will probably uh, say badly the names, but uh, yeah, all the all the names that uh, Emily said. I think it's very it's very important, and this is the basis where we should go. And we also want to put there some um, some way to prop the model, so you can have something. So we've been working a little bit with the team from. Um, MIT Watson uh, uh, from uh, Edric, uh, which is about doing experts. So this is one way you can explore the activation, putting your own um, prompt for the model. But we would like to have a lot of a lot more thing where you can prop this model and basically that people can start to. Well, my idea was that now that it's possible to upload model card, people will like upload them and start to discuss also about like gender thing and like modify the model card of BERT to add some new information about gender bias and BERT and things like that. Um, now we're also discovering that you need to push a little bit more the people than just uh, opening the door. So I think we try to make this uh, a lot more attractive and a lot more easy to use and uh, inter interesting for people to like add content, basically a bit like Wikipedia if you want, but for model checkpoints. Uh, but that's always our, our way to see that very community build and like bottom to top rather than just top to bottom. Uh, but yeah, I think, I think it's really, really important, this thing to have better documentation and maybe f more for like um, your, the, the people uh, looking at this, um, at this uh, the, the panel here is we also would like to have a way to compare the model, like to upload like standardized way. We have all these models and we should have way to compare them along some lines. So there is obviously the metrics and the performance on like some data set, but also you may want to have like uh, metrics for, and there is some metrics for bias. Well, there, there are discussion around this, but there is some way you can start to measure the thing and you could also compare them also having like some um, standardized benchmark for all of them. I think this is really important. And that's definitely something we, we're working on and we want to push. Mm -hmm. And uh, and like, 
uh, further explaining the to to what Thomas just mentioned about probing and so on. So maybe a question for Anna. So is it possible like to convert your, uh, your works on what Bert, uh, on studying Bert, right? On uh, trying to open it up what it actually learns into some kind of a tool so that people could pick it up, uh, run this, so to say, analysis on it, on uh, whatever they model they, they choose. Let's abstract ourselves from the, uh, again, from the architecture and basically use something something like that okay and it seems to me that uh, this model is is the less biased in my particular case so is there does any uh, such a tool exist or is it still uh, very much more of a academic scientific question for now um such tool such a tool does not exist and uh, i'm very sorry to have to say that um i have developed such a tool for word embeddings right before bird came out um, so yes, yeah, so right before BERT came out, I came up with with a way to actually measure what kind of information different word embeddings prioritize. So you can see not just uh, what kind of data they're trained on, although that's very important, but also for each specific model like Glavo, or Kipgram or whatever, uh, does it prefer to pu push together synonyms or antonyms or hypernyms or uh, some kind of actual knowledge. So um, I have figured out how to do that for static word embeddings um, and then BERT came out and I spent almost two years trying to figure out how that works and how we could do something like that for BERT. Um, so far, I have no idea. Okay. Yeah. okay. So that's what I meant. That's what I meant. We study BERT and then another one comes up and then people switch because it simply performs better but yes and uh, that's precisely the question that i was getting two years ago uh we likewise had an explosion of version embeddings uh, do i take glove or do i take skip gram or do i check le take let's check or whatever uh people just come up to me as developers and they say i don't want to read all those papers tell me which one to, to pick and now it's exactly the same situation except with transformers uh and except with transformers uh there's uh, not just um well, they're incomparable, not just in objectives and uh, the hardware training and uh, who did it and uh, what data they used. Uh, there's just no way we can do any kind of principled experiments on them anymore just because they're so huge. So in a way, they have the same thing as two years ago, but worse. Okay. We have one experiment that shows that actually uh, uh, glove embeddings and small transformer on top of it performs better than BERT without pre-training and small, but it's BERT without fine-tuning. It's very important, yeah. But fine-tuned BERT in this case was also not that good. So it's actually, it was better to use uh, glove plus small transformer and, uh, but it's in one particular data set. So I just, what does that mean? It doesn't mean that BERT is the best, it really doesn't. Sometimes, sometimes it's not. But uh, yeah, in the interest of time, I would like to, uh, switch slightly back to the um, to the first question. So we, we briefly said that uh, these language models they mostly capture some form and not the meaning. And uh, but f the typical pipeline uh, I would say when developing chatbot is develop a separate analysis system that would classify our phrases into intent and entities, and then these intent and entities are used in the dialogue management tool. And and my question is does creating this uh, a data set of phrase corresponding to intent, do we add meaning by adding this intent label or not? Because in this case, we do have, right? So we have intent greed or help me intent help. We do have some kind of a meaning, at least in terms of our narrow or like request a restaurant. Uh, so do we actually add meaning or is it still a just slightly different version of a form? Um, we just, you know, a leap, uh, we just classify into buckets and it's still kind of meaningless. It of, of, depends, of course, on what meaning it is, but like, what is your point of view on, on that? Shall I jump in here? Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so, yes, I think that when you are classifying um, user utterances into user intents, that is a kind of meaning. Um, and it's in particular, um, Basically, the, you're saying my system is going to interpret these user utterances as indications of this user intent, and I'm going to treat them as if I understood the user to have meant that thing. And that's fine, and I think it's, it's key to making these chatbots function at all, as opposed to the, the chatbots that are really just to chat, 
those ones don't have to have a model of user intent, right? It's just sort of, well, what's the thing you might say? Um, and then you open yourself up to all kinds of problems. Like if you remember the Tay fiasco from Microsoft a few years back, where it was supposed to learn what to say next based on what people said to it. And so people jumped in and just trained it to be awful. Um, so setting aside that, um, if you've got a chatbot that basically says, okay, here are the kinds of user attempts that I'm capable of handling. And I'm going to learn how to recognize when I think the user has said one of those things, um, then I think a very legitimate application of the language model, which is you know, effectively a very large distributional model of language, is to sort of expand the set of ways someone might say something that you can recognize as likely belonging to that bucket. Um, and I think, I think that's fine. I think that it's a very practical approach. Um, I've done some criticism of that approach, not in terms of building practical systems, because it's fine for building practical systems, but it's not a way towards getting towards general purpose natural language understanding, because it's all about focusing this broad range of ways people might say it into the particular intents that we know how to deal with. And it doesn't therefore work on learning how language works as a compositional meaning making system. Um, but that's fine. If your purpose is to make a chatbot that can handle specific kinds of customer requests and you want the customer to be able to say it many different ways, then leveraging language models to help you recognize what might be one of those different ways is great. Um, as a syntactician, I'm curious, um, you know, I always want to get in and sort of like, okay, can I break it? Does the language model really understand enough about, for example, negation and hedging and indirect requests? Like, can I, can I find the corner cases that it's not going to handle well? And I, you know, would encourage everyone to go hire linguists who can do that kind of stress testing. Um, but I think it is a reasonable approach. And I think it is um, legitimate to call that meaning. And Hazard, we do know that negation, it does not understand. <laughs> Well, and also uh, from experience, uh, uh, you are not the only one who tries to break. As soon as people know that it is chatbot, it's, it's literally everyone. Uh, it's ridiculous how, many, how often people ask about the weather. Poor chatbots. Uh, <laughs> yeah, uh, that's true. Uh, and Thomas, maybe like from your experience of creating chatbots in Hagen phase. So is there anything to add uh, to what Emily mentioned regarding this? Um, uh, yeah, no, I think it's, it's also make me think about this fun. There was a fun competition at the MNLP, I think two years ago, which was build it, break it, I think. The, so there were two teams, one team trying to build something and the other team trying to break it. That was really cool. That was a good idea. You should do that more. Um, but yeah, yeah, I agree. I think it's interesting. I also think it's nice because um, well, uh, in general, I'm more like interested by, I think, NLG, because I think NLU kind of sometimes uh, make us uh, focus too much on the specific task, maybe on the specific data set and kind of overfit on the way we, we do that. And, and it has this tendency to make us overfit on annotation because we have this thing. But it's also nice because we have these clear labels and this um, easy way then to try to uh, do adversarial investigation of the model where we try to switch the label or in the model without like meaningful transformation and we can this is one way we can try to get some understanding on this model uh, there was this contrastive set uh, evaluation paper like that I read actually uh, two days ago this which is nice I think trying to uh, investigate the boundary of the classification is a good way to to well, at least we, we feel like we get some understanding of this model. I don't know if you really understand them, but yeah, it's a good way. But yeah, in general, um, I think uh, I believe that in the end, we'll have to move to more open domain thing, just like because, because it's the only way we can like really look very far in how we want to understand language and, and this and this thing. So yeah. This is my opinion, but I know that, for instance, Sam Bowman doesn't doesn't agree with me at all. He thinks like, uh, and he's, he's right. I think we can still probably do a lot with NLU, but at some time we will have to move to more flexible structure and stop like trying to evaluate the model on three class classification. This is this is definitely something that's too easy to overfit. But here, probably, I think linguistic is definitely the way we we could design better evaluation. Well, that's it. That's what I hope. My, my linguist background is not, is not deep enough to really be able to contribute to this mission. But, but my, uh, my uh, layman view of that is that probably you have a way to design better evaluation, at least know where all of this fails better. So, yeah. But uh, so if, so suppose we give this 
this limited li me uh, uh, meaning uh, through these intent labels, user intent labels that the, our bot operator is. Is there a way also maybe from linguistic to find the limitation of the system? Because there is a, a rather simple example, for example, uh, I don't know. So we have a bot uh, that calculates how much carbon offset is uh, needed to when you use the certain flight. And then the bot asks, okay, I'm going to fly there and there. And then some users answered, unfortunately, which in this particular case means yes. But in, from the NLU, separate NLU component, it's, uh, it's actually no most probably. So uh, is there a way to somehow circumvent this problem? Because uh, there are words, right? And unfortunately, it's one of them, but there are millions that actually so strongly context dependent. But on the other hand, you cannot train it only in this context because it will just overfit to this previous phrase because when we have a separate NLU and dialogue manager, the separation is quite clear. It's right now is very easy to create. If we transfer to the, you know, text to text dialogues, it's completely different story. And then, uh, and there, so if we at this point think, okay, unfortunately it doesn't have intent. So we're going to switch to text to text, but then, don't we have exactly the same problem again where we lose meaning because we, we, we decided not to use these labels? So we kind of decided not to use meaning and we still again create text to text that we're gonna learn some form to form uh, these minuscule statistics from this particular end to end dialogue that we have. Is there a way to combine them together somehow? At least maybe on the not general natural language understanding, I'm not even speaking about, even on this simple kind of seemingly simple example that at least for me uh, I still not sure how to particular solve it so maybe if you if you have any comments about this introducing meaning reducing meaning and so on so I just want to say that's a lovely lovely example the um, <laughs> I'm going to hold on to it if you don't mind um, but I think that uh, I mean certainly from a linguistic point of view we uh, linguistics can inform what's going on there and what you might need to do to make a, make a system that's fully robust to that, right? Um, and what you need to look into is, I think Vladimir may have frozen. Hopefully, he, hopefully we're still being recorded. Um, what you need to do is look into um, discourse relations and coherence relations to be able to basically reason about, um, unfortunately, seems like a non sequitur there. We lost him. Well, it's still recording. <laughs> um, unfortunately, it seems like a non sequitur, but that's, um, it means something in context if you assume that the discourse is coherent. So why, why would this person have said, unfortunately, if the discourse is coherent? Um, well, what's expected here is an answer to a question. Um, we are in the context of talking about carbon offsets. Flying so far is going to create a lot of carbon impact, so it's unfortunate oh, that's a yes. And so there are sort of branches of linguistics that can help understanding that and um, having those collections of examples where it shows up in um, actual, you know, chatbot interactions would be a fantastic way, I think, to, um, to get to that. Um, but Anna, I was hoping to hear you speak um, about uh, how to construct better evaluations, because um, I know that you've done a lot of thinking about that recently. Um, about evaluations for... Um for, for, for such systems, for robotic systems, or sure, <laughs> favorite topic. Uh, um, oh well, I haven't done anything in about ten bots whatsoever, I must confess. Um, uh, and I guess in in this context, uh, that in this example that uh, Vlad has said about, uh, I think you're completely right. It's the users that uh, will actually be training. Uh, so that will be given these examples. Um, I, I, I don't think we are going to ever be able to even hope to exhaust that. So yes, yeah, so, uh, th th there are linguists and um, there are discourse relations and there's all this lovely theory about how we could interpret this. Um, but that's to handle a case that we already determined as problematic. <laughs> and uh, uh, I guess the original question was, uh, what can we do to even determine that it's problematic? online and uh, how to handle it as a chatbot. I, I don't have an answer to that. Uh, um, and and, and that's, uh, that's kind of my problem with, um, I don't know, the, the way deep learning has been going and 
why we need bad evaluations the whole time, this whole time because um, they are great when they work, but we need to know when they break and we don't. And that's what I would hope that an, a good evaluation system would do. It would uh, flag those edge cases and it would uh, tell us what we can reasonably expect this model to do and uh, like, and, and likely maybe this only thing that we could expect this model to do well. And uh, I unfortunately don't see as much work being done on that as uh, yeah. I your guess or your bet on uh, on this? What what do you think is interesting in terms of uh, future direction for evaluation? Do, do you have um, something? Uh, well, I'd love to be able to do what I did for static web embeddings. Um, uh, the idea there was uh, very simple. You just take a bunch of uh, linguistic indicators which you think might be a predictive of performance on certain downstream tasks. I use just uh, yes, different lexicographic relations, uh, um, whether a model encoded uh, uh, frequent collocations, whether it tended to collect uh, and represent numbers well. And then I saw, uh, just check how often the different word embeddings prioritize that and how that correlated with their performance on a battery of downstream tasks. And actually I did see a correlation. I saw that certain types of information would be a good for a model to do well on post tracking and would uh, be bad for it to also do well on sentiment analysis. And that was kind of a red flag for me. We probably cannot actually expect to build one system that will excel at everything. Um, so yeah, if, uh, if I had a chance and uh, uh, the possibility to work on this more, I'd, I'd love to be able to do this for contextual embeddings, but we need uh, a lot more than um, once we went contextual, we opened the whole world of road test disambiguation on top of the word embeddings, which we also didn't understand that well. And I think we are currently hitting that wall. So in terms of um, thinking from a, the practical point of view of somebody actually building one of these, um, you raised the question, Anna, of how do we know when it's, when it's wrong? Um, and certainly having that as a component would be really helpful. But I think also there's scope to design for the possibility that it's going to be wrong some of the times and to think about failure modes and how you can um, recover from them. So coming back to Vladimir's example of the uh, carbon offset chatbot, um, you have this conversation with the chatbot and if at the end it displays, okay, here's what I understood before you take any action, um, then that would be a, you know, a way to say, oh, okay, no, that didn't work, let me start again, and the failure remains contained. And so I think there's a lot to be said for um, when people are doing practical applications based on this technology, spending some time thinking about what, what happens when it works as intended, and sometimes there's harms there too, but also um, what happens when it doesn't work as intended? What's the possible failure modes and what would happen downstream from that? And then what can we put in as sort of a, a safety net? Yeah, Indeed. totally agree. Just from my personal experience talking with a lot of people doing chatbots, I think most of the time, well, I mean, like conversation, like more like customer service chat, but most of the time it works well when there is a human in the loop in the end and we use this thing as tool for like helping uh, mm -hmm. rather than like end-to-end -end thing that are supposed to work on their own. And it's definitely, yeah, a lot safer, I think. Yeah. It's probably the way we should design this, right? Like a complement, an extension of humans rather than the replacement. It's this. Mm -hmm. It's uh, sometimes there is no, there is no really, um, how to say, there is no capability, right? So if you're a small business, for example, and you want, you actually want chatbot just to be on your own, right? You want it to be, uh, to be independent, at least kind of human in the low loop offline, so to say, right? So that later human can take a look at the conversation that happened is, yeah. And regarding earlier, so for example, there are so much negativity in this particular example of carbon of uh, carbon offset uh, uh, chatbot. We actually collected very good uh, offensive data set uh, mm -hmm. from it. And if chatbot on top of that makes a mistake that amplifies uh, the lack of involvement of the users. So users not only gains this chatbot, they might be against the topic as well. And when it doesn't work, it just, you know, 
I, so as a, as a people, person who talked to the bot, I might be okay, you know, kind of playing around when it works. I might be aggressive or might be against it, but I will continue playing around. But as soon as it stops working, it completely breaks. And then it asks me whether it did something right or wrong. And that's sometimes people don't even answer, right? So why would I, why would I get involved? It's, uh, or sometimes it just uh, proves the point, like that's what people want to do, right? So they want to break the machine and they, they do it and then they lose interest. Uh, yeah, cool, sorry. <laughs> Just to that point of when when it's clear that it's a chatbot, people like to play with it. Um, and I understand that that would be sort of frustrating um, for chatbot developers, but I think it is really critical that the chatbots um, announce themselves as chatbots because yeah. it's the, you know, it's the person on the other side of the conversation who really is in charge of understanding is meaning being conveyed or not. And if they think they're talking to another person, then all kinds of problems can break out. And I think that that opens up a lot of risks for the companies running these chatbots if they conceal the fact that they're chatbots. Yeah, absolutely. I also think we always recommend that uh, if you develop a chatbot, always chatbot should always answer that I am a chatbot. Uh, otherwise, it's, it's maybe even an ethical issue in my opinion, right? So mm -hmm. if you pretend that it is not so. Uh, cool. Uh, yes, yeah, sorry, my internet was interrupted. So I'm a bit lost when in discussion we are at, 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 at this point. But uh, yeah, I'll, I'll gloss over and I would like to from these uh, meanings and the language models slightly to a more uh, uh, mathematical uh, engineering point of view. So we came up with this, not we, Google came up with this transform architecture that is surprisingly works quite well for text. And in our experiments, it works even better uh, for uh, uh, it works even better for dialogue uh, when we try to mirror, to model the dialogue time and so on. And my question is, did we find an optimal architecture? What do you think? Is it as good for these textual problems as, as convolutional neural networks for images? Or are we not quite there yet? Any opinions, any sort of... Uh, Can give some if you, unless you have something. Um, I know. Oh, well, I, I, I was, uh, I, I haven't heard on computer vision at all. Are CNNs considered to be the best that can possibly be? No, I'm, I'm not saying that they're best that possibly be, but they are like reasonably, reasonably good. Like uh, the progress in, 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 in computer vision is, is, is much, in my opinion, is, much, is further than in, in, in the NLP, in the text processing. But uh, regardless of the conversion you does, do you think that transformer is an optimal architecture, or do you think uh, there are certain critical properties that arch this architecture cannot model, or that is lacking? Maybe. So I, I think if if it's an optimal architecture, and I am not the one to have an opinion about that, um, but I do have the opinion that all it could possibly be an optimal architecture for is the specific problem that it's been set up to solve. And that problem is sometimes sold as language, which is a huge overclaim, right? The problem that has been set up to solve is uh, language modeling, and then in particular language modeling where words are treated um, as able to vary across contexts. So is it an optimal architecture for that? Thomas will be much more informed than I am. Is it an optimal architecture for language writ large? Obviously not, because it's not, that's not the problem that it's trying to solve. Exactly. And uh, to back up uh, your point, um, there was a lovely paper in NACA last year. Um, I think it was called Shifting the Baseline. Um, and it uh, looked at uh, how we do on uh, multimodal data sets. Uh, actually, I'm not sure if, if it was about transformers at all, but uh, basically what they found was that uh, uh, you do much better by ignoring either modality. <laughs> <laughs> in any setting. So uh, we, we definitely know that, uh, that text does not exist in the vacuum. Text comes from people, text comes with intentions, text comes with, uh, you know, world grounding. So that, that is the problem that we need to solve and not language models. Yeah. But in, uh, in my opinion, uh, architecture is in mathematical contrast construct, not, a trans not as BERT, but as a just this attentional sequential model uh, is uh, more or less problem independent. 
it's kind of a way to uh, to process the, the sequential input. Uh, so, uh, so Emily, you said that it's we are far away, but is there any sort of uh, maybe properties that we are missing in there for the uh, for the modeling of the of the language, or is it well we, we are like too early to say? We just know that we are not here there yet. We're not we're not testing the right things to know that mm, we're there. Okay, yet, is my point. Um, okay. And I suspect that if we um, developed, if we put as much energy into developing tasks as we do into developing models, um, then we might be further down that path. Um, and we will be able to have a more informed answer as to, you know, what parts of the bigger real world construct that we're trying to model with the tasks are approached or not approached, um, as opposed to putting all the energy in the models and building enormous um, sort of task independent, the pre-training data sets to beef them up even further, doesn't illuminate what's going on in actual human language processing, which I take to be the big picture task. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it's more like, it just we don't have the tools yet to even find out uh, what the optimal means. Do I understand correctly in, the, in, the, in this case? Yeah. 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 I think I agree with this fact that we tend to focus too much on models which is a bit kind of, I mean, self-inflicted thing because I think the reviewers in our community kind of <laughs> push in this direction, right? It's kind of strange. We're like, oh, we should stop doing that. And then you review your paper, you're like, oh, not enough modeling. <laughs> but um, yeah, to answer your question, maybe just a, a bit with an ML approach. Um, I think um, if we compare to RNN, there is definitely something interesting in Transformer which is that you keep this globally sequentially approach, but there is this easiness to jump to uh, previous uh, information that was far away, which is something that was hard in RNN with these vanishing memories. So um, there is not enough, I think also there is not enough uh, studies that compare all the architecture we have and try to see on linguistic tasks, which one are better. So there is one I like a lot by Duke Upkes on compositionality. Uh, so I, I keep uh, saying it's a great paper, but it's really a great paper. It's called The Compositionality of Neural Networks. It's a very long paper, but it's worth it. And um, it's, it's one of the only one I see where they compare uh, a, a range of architecture, like LSTM, ConvNet, because there's also ConvNet, right? There's also this work by uh, Jan Dauphin that was really cool uh, on ConvNet for text and transformers. And transformers kind of seems to be really better for compositionality, which is just one aspect in linguistic, which is, is uh, supposed to be, well, a lot of people say it's an important one. And, um, and so there is difference in uh, how you can model uh, this, um, this um, not really a yeah, task, but sort of more aspects of, of language with this architecture. So it's clear. That's what we sometimes call, I think, inductive bias, which is very blurry defined term, but which means that it, it will go, in my opinion, we go faster to the solution we wanted to go when we, when we use some data to, to train our model. So I think it's a better architecture, in my opinion, to RNN, I think, uh, for some aspect. I think it's it would be interesting to compare better the two. Sometimes the community are a bit split. There are the people who only work on RNN, people who only work on transformers, and we should kind of make them work together a little bit more, I think. <laughs> well, that's what I wanted to do at the origin with, uh, with the, this easiness of access to this model. Um, but saying it's the optimal architecture, I'm very uh, optimistic. So I think we will find better things in the future. So I don't think it's the end of the story, or at least I hope it's not the end. And in particular, um, it's pretty clear that we'll have to like leave just the pure surface form of text and do like multimodal or like knowledge base or more uh, graph representation. In addition, if we want to add some like semantic, uh, whatever we put under the, the name semantic, but like uh, additional information. And here the door is still open, right? We we reuse transformer to model this data as well, maybe, or we, we need some other architecture. So for instance, right now, the people who do multimodal, they use faster CNN, faster, um, they use CNN architecture for the, for the um, vision part and transformers. So yeah, there is, there is, I think there's a, the door is just opening on how we will, design new architecture for multimodal input or like more complex inputs. And as far as uh, sequential nature of uh, transformers, I, I find it kind of funny that uh, 
on, on the one hand, yes, it's much better at handling long distance relations than RNNs used to be. But uh, at the same time, it doesn't really have the order in it. And uh, the attention also doesn't really have order in it either. You're looking at the whole sequence at the same time, and that's not what humans can do. And uh, uh, definitely humans can't do it with 12 heads at the same time. Um, so um, I, I'm not sure, I'm not quite sure what we are getting out of it, even after working on it for two years, but it's definitely not what we ideally would want to get out of it. Mm -hmm. yeah. From my point of view, I, only can, I totally agree yeah, that it's hard to, to say what is optimal or not, but it's in, a, in, a, in a, we have actually a paper about it that at least for modeling the dialogue time, if we abstract ourselves from the text and work in this intent action name uh, kind of sequence, then transformer seems to perform well, be way better than LSTM because it managed, as you said, uh, because it looks like for, at least for the, di for the data set that we had, you don't really need to know all the, all the previous steps. You just usually pay attention to one or two key moments. And that's what transformer is perfect to do in. Uh, so that where LSTM needs to forget certain things in the history of dialogue, transformer never knew it. It just needs to pay attention to correct, uh, to correct, uh, to correct utterance in the history. So that, that seems to be more effective, at least, than LSTM in terms of training. But, Ooh, uh, yeah. Uh, but it still can't, um, OK. So it, it, it's better when you need to just remember the recent thing. But if you need to remember the right thing back in the past, then we're still stuck, right? Yeah, uh, it depends how do you find right. If you're right, if your current time and the right thing in the past appears very often, then the attention will learn that this thing is what you pay attention. Sorry for the pun, but uh, I don't know how to always phrase it. Uh, so you actually, it manages, at least in these limited settings of this in user intent, bot uh, utterance pairs, you know, these keywords, it managed to pick up the, the history quite well, surprisingly sometimes. So it skips some chit chats, it skips very well. Uh, because it just knows that it appears everywhere in the history, so it's just like not important to the prediction that next step. Co compared to LSTM, that LSTM needs to learn to forget, you know, to train its forget gates to actually get, forget the, the chit chat ever happened. While Transformer starts from a different point of view where it needs, to, yeah. But yeah, so it's just from my point of view. Of, of, and I wanted to. To, to see what your opinion on this regarding this still, even though it's actually already three years old, right? But still considered to be new in, in the ML community. Uh, yeah, I believe that we are uh, approaching the end of our panel. And I would like to wrap up with just one question that I got asked several times. And just, you know, just maybe if, if each of you answers that. Do you believe that we had ImageNet moment? I don't know if you're familiar, there was this, uh, blog, uh, this famous blog post, and I am curious whether you agree with this notion or not. I hope not. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> you, have to, you have to say more. <laughs> no? yeah, I'm, not, I'm not sure what ImageNet moment is meant to, uh, what, what the analogy is meant to be. Okay, maybe it's out of, uh, yeah, because there was a, somewhere uh, people say that BERT is the ImageNet no moment of NLP because ImageNet, uh, creation of ImageNet uh, made a huge progress in, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the computer vision because this, first of all, it's a huge data set, then it is this convolutional neural network that managed to train on it and so on. And we had a huge boost and pre-training on images actually works compared to pre-training on, it seems to be working way better compared to pre-training on language. Uh, it's definitely not what happened with BERT because the image net is a uh, moment, is a formulation of a task plus creation of a huge resource for the task and then the uh, appearance of, a, of an architecture to do that. Uh, in our case, I don't think we have the perfect data. Or, well, we won't, we'll never have a perfect data, but uh, I don't think we have quite something as behemoth um, as uh, image net. Yeah. yeah, so so BERT doesn't correspond to ImageNet because ImageNet, as Anna says, was fundamentally a, a resource and a task. And BERT is a model. 
and backgrounds the training data. Um, so certainly, you know, what happened in our uh, main conferences was, you know, we had, we had the word embeddings coming through and then we had Bert coming through and, and you know, Bert and its kin. And um, there were big jumps on the state of the art on various tasks. Um, but, and that felt like progress in some ways because, wow, these numbers are getting bigger and they're getting bigger really fast. Um, but from where I sit, the, those numbers didn't really correspond to any deeper understanding of how it was happening. Um, and the most exciting things happening around BERT is actually the Bertology work. So Anna and others looking into, um, okay, what is it learning when it's learning? What's it learning about language? Um, when it's getting things wrong, um, what's going on? But also more importantly, when it's getting things right, what's going on? So there was a wonderful paper um, by Neven and Cow at ACL last year, um, sort of saying oh, here you know Bert just blew away the leaderboard on this thing but that doesn't seem right what actually happened and sure enough they go in and they find um, that it's basically overfitting to artifacts and things like that so the exciting part of all this to me is looking at what's learned by these big models and not the jumps on the leaderboards um, and so I wouldn't I would say that's the moment um, and what's missing is I'm just going to be a broken record here but you know really good task and data set creation so that we can actually get a better sense of what these things are learning. Yeah, uh, yeah, I really agree. I think the, yeah, we can uh, focus the analogy on transfer learning, but, but the analogy is really more on this, this big uh, interest well, for me. I mean, we're all NLP lovers, right? So basically we've all been waiting for NLP to become the central part of all the AI field and the most uh, exciting part to be in. And, and I'm really happy this is kind of what's happening. I remember when we hired the Victor, which was our first research scientist, he wanted to work on computer vision. And after like six months, he was still like, oh, I'm just doing NLP, but I would really like to work on computer vision. And like last month, he said he applied to a lot of PhD. He, he got actually some really, really good uh, offers from, from US University. And in the end, he was like, actually, I want to stay where I am. This is really the place which is the most exciting right now. So I think this is really cool, in my opinion. I think it's really nice that a lot of people are excited about going to work in NLP. And this is, a, um, this is really a place which is nice to be and uh, to see all these burgeoning ideas. Um, and uh, maybe the best thing about this will be, in fact, that we kind of focus back again on the task on the data set and try to see if we have actually solved anything or if we've just moved. Yeah, so, so that's something that's really, really important. So, so I don't want to finish on, on, on uh, this talking, but on, on what we do. So maybe you will say something after that. But just a word is that we, we've just opened source library, which is made to share easily, more easily data sets and in NLP, because I think it's really important. And to try also to make metrics more reusable. So it's called the Hugging Face NLP. And um, this is something you can, you can try to play with. This is really the idea. So we've gathered like 116 data sets right now, I think, on NLP. And all of them are designed to be easy, accessible, easy, uh, easy to dive in them and to try to test the metrics on them. So yeah, I really hope this will be like the next revolution, people focusing back on this thing and a little bit out of the models or maybe a little bit less, more like balanced. I would also ask, uh, that's exactly the reason why I asked this question. Uh, I would also add to why, in my opinion, it's, it, this comparison is non-valid as well, is on an even simpler, maybe from my point, from my opinion, a simple point of view is that images, they are more or less the same in all over the world. I am a non-English speaker, and for me, progress on English is the least interesting thing. And unfortunately, we can say that we have this we can call BERT a break breakthrough, right? But in my opinion, it's only in English. Uh, uh, the comparable multilingual BERT model is so bad that sometimes it's better not to use it at all and just simple back of words perform better on many, many different tasks and different languages. So that's why I think we also cannot say that, uh, even though the progress is very exciting, like the so for example, in my opinion, the transformer architecture itself is like extremely interesting uh, finding and extremely interesting idea and a different, from slightly different point of view, from the point like how do we process sequences, not by by one, but simultaneously. This is the point where I think we made a progress. Most probably it's not optimal or we hopefully will create something better, but I think this is the important. And the reason I, 
I, I like it be, because actually the reason I like this architecture is because it's task independent. It's the architecture itself is task and therefore language independent. And therefore it is not uh, to some extent, like the, the mathematical architecture, I know Emily made so, it. So, yeah. so you, can, you can apply it to any language, but that's yes. different from expecting it to work equally well in every language because languages, as you yes. point out, are different to each other and they're different in the way the... Um, order is important versus not, how much inflection you have on the words, lots of things that, that are really important. Um, and so, yeah, so this is, this is, when you say language independent in the sense of, I can throw it at any language, sure, but that's meant, different from expecting it to work equally well. Yes, yes, that's true, that's true. This is, yeah, this is, this is exact, but this is what we see, right? This is like, it works much worse on Russian than on English. So that's, yeah, but at least, at least you can apply it to any language, right? Uh, mm -hmm. While BERT as a model, you, it's mostly English, right? If I, I know that I'm mixing up uh, several uh, several ideas, what is machine learned model and what is trained machine learned model on certain data set, but I, I, I notice so often that these ideas are mixed in many people's mind anyhow. So because quite often when I say transformers to people, they ask me again about BERT instead of, and I'm like, no, 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 it's just a tiny, two layer, 256 transformers, and there's no, no, no notion of pre-training as well. So this is, this exists, yeah. Cool, uh, yeah, uh, any, uh, maybe if anyone wants to add something on top of some, 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 some remarks um, to, to close it, otherwise I guess we are a bit over time and it's, yeah. yeah. Well, thank you very much for organizing this and I hope that it was useful um, to the developers in the audience. Yeah, thanks. It was a great moment. Enjoy. Thank you very much for participating. Yeah, I tried to build it up so that it would be equally interesting. So I know that we all, we all have different backgrounds, but I tried to find at least the common medium so that it would be interesting for us and therefore have a chance to be interesting for our audience because if people who are participating in discussion are not interested in that, that I, in my opinion, that audience will be bored much faster. Yeah. Thank you very much, and uh, very much, thank you very much for our audience uh, for listening, and hopefully that we we said something interesting that we said maybe clarified or hopefully uh, touched some things that uh, maybe some people didn't know, so that you can further you can check out Emily's works, you can check out. Uh, Thomas's blog post and Hagen Face Library, and also, of course, Anna's uh, blog post and, uh, and Anna's works uh, to get a further to dig deeper and uh, find out the, the actually interesting and complicated details and maybe understand the perspective why, why it is a bit more complicated than when we say AI. Um, just picking up, if I may add something. So, um, this is a great initiative to try to kind of match the developers and researchers because we often don't talk face to face and uh, then we have these uh, frustrating for developers moments when uh, when they come and say okay what should i use and we say ah <laughs> because, <laughs> because there's no easy answer well there is no easy answer because this is research and we don't have easy answers and uh, these things won't uh, happen any easier or faster if we if there's a community that don't ever talk to each other so uh, maybe a good thing to do would be to uh, jump on Twitter because that, that's where a lot of uh, NLP researchers are. And uh, whenever you have a problem uh, that uh, you can see some papers about, maybe find that person, try to talk to them and maybe that, that would be the best way to get some leads. Yeah, that's a good point. You should follow Anna and Emily on Twitter and follow the people they follow. I think it's a, it's a good way. The, the community is, is very good. <laughs> For sure. Yeah, no, fantastic. And then we'll take some questions now. So if people want to stick around, uh, ask some questions and chat with our panelists, uh, it'd be a great time to do so now. <laughs>